Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today I want to talk about the theory of elliptic integrals, which occurs in the theory of complex analysis, and show how the cubic curve can be used to understand and study this gadget. And to motivate this video, I want to remind you of an integral you would have seen in your first year calculus course. It's one of form the integral of dx on the square root of a quadratic term like 1 minus x squared. Now, of course, this is something which is very, very easy to integrate, and you would have learned that in your first year calculus course. Now, we can make this a little bit more complicated by just, instead of having a quadratic term in the square root, replacing it with a cubic term like this. And then also ask, well, what about this integral here? Well, it turns out that this is much harder. In fact, it's a completely new function that you wouldn't have seen previously in your first year calculus course. And one of the reasons for that is because this integral here is related to an integral on a conic. And projected conics are isomorphic to projected lines. However, this integral here is related to cubic curves. In fact, an integral on a cubic curve. And as a result, uh, the theory here is much more complicated. Nevertheless, understanding the geometry of the cubic curve is going to actually tell us something about this integral. And in fact, it's going to tell us about something called the addition law. So to tell you about the addition law, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a rather banal case where it's completely trivial, but at least the ideas are very clear. So the point of view I want to take is that a cubic curve, remember, is isomorphic to a two torus. So let's set up the notation for our two torus as follows. Remember, we can consider the complex manifold, just the complex numbers. It's a one dimensional complex manifold. Inside here, we have a group, Z plus Z tau, where the imaginary part of tau is positive. So as a group, this is just z to the 2. It's the direct sum of two copies of z. And we, when we take the quotient of c by lambda, what we get is topologically a 2 torus. So that's what I've drawn over here, a 2 torus. And cubic curves topologically look like this 2 torus here. Now we want to do some integration, an integration on this 2 torus here. Well, it turns out that the usual differential dz on c, of course, gives you a differential on c mod lambda. So in other words, this is just a way of integrating things on here. And basically, it works because locally, on this c mod lambda, on this two torus, it just looks like an open subset of c in the neighborhood of each point. And so you can do integration on that open neighborhood as usual. Now, what's very important in this example here that's very special is the fact that there is an extra group structure here. And that's the thing which is going to give us our addition law. So there's a group structure here because this is a group and this is a subgroup. So this is just a quotient group. And in particular, what we can do is we can look at the symmetry of this group and how it acts. So the symmetry is given by translations on the torus. And so you can try to translate this differential too. If you haven't so seen this sort of thing before, let me show you how it works. So for example, we can do a change of variable. Instead of looking at z, which gives us our dz, we can pick a constant inside c or c mod lambda that we translate by. And that, that gives us a new function y equals z plus c. And then the translation of this dz by c, to, to speak, is just dy. And of course, if you compute the differential of dy, since this is linear, it's just equal to dz. So translating this dz by a constant c doesn't change it. And in that sense, this dz is invariant. OK, great. But what does that buy for us? Okay, What can we do with this extra invariance property? Well, it's the following. Suppose we want to integrate this dz, this differential, 
along some curve gamma, which goes from A to B on the torus. What can we do? Well, we can certainly do that, and we get something like the integral of gamma over gamma of dz. We can also just shift this entire curve by some constant c, and that gives us a new curve. Let me draw it in for you now. So maybe A gets shifted to A plus C, and B gets shifted to B plus C, and more generally this curve gets shifted to something like that. So that's gamma plus C. That gives you a new curve, and you can integrate over that. And just by a simple change of variables, we see that, of course, the integral over this gamma plus c is just the same as the integral over gamma. That's what invariance buys for us. Okay, so let's look at the addition law in this special case here. And in this case, it really doesn't tell us anything interesting. But it will show you the general principles at work when you want to try to integrate on some complex manifold with some extra group structure. Okay, so let's, uh, rather than writing these integrals with the path, let's just use the endpoints. So you have the integral from 0 to A of dz, plus the integral from 0 to B of dz. I want to express this as a single integral. Well, how can I do that? Well, I can shift the path from 0 to B by adding A to it. So instead of going from 0 to B, it goes from A to A plus B. That means that I have the sum of the integral from 0 to A now with the integral from A to A plus B. And of course, we can easily add these two integrals since this upper limit is the same as this bottom limit to get this is the integral from 0 to A plus B. So this addition law allows us to show that the sum of two specific definite integrals equals a third definite integral. Now, you might say, well, this is clear because if you compute the actual values, this is just A, this integral is A, this integral is just B, and this integral is just A plus B. So really, we haven't gained anything that we didn't already know. Before I move on to the non-banal case, which is the cubic curves, and see how, in that case, you actually get an interesting theorem, let me just make one warning. We were a little bit naughty when we wrote this integral here. When you write an integral on some manifold, you really have to state the path that you integrate over. If you change the path, you'll get a different answer. So what happens if you change the path? Well, what's something that you can do? Well, one of the things that you can do is integrate along some path that goes back to itself, like a cycle and then integrate along that path. And if you think about what that does, integrating along those cycles, the only answers that you can get are complex numbers which lie in this lattice lambda. They're the only possibilities. So really, to read this equation properly, how should you read this? These integrals, they're only defined modulo lambda. But at least you can certainly read this as an equation in the group C mod lambda. Now to make this addition law work, what do we need in our argument? We needed the group structure on the two torus and also an invariant differential. Now remember, non-singular cubic curves are also isomorphic to these two tori. So in fact, they also have these two properties. So if we apply this argument, in that case, we will now get something rather interesting. Let's see what we get. So we're going to start with a non-singular cubic curve of this form, y squared equals x cubed plus alpha x plus beta. And just to remind you, this non-singularity ensures that it is indeed isomorphic to some two torus as opposed to something that's singular and which is not a manifold. In terms of the parameters alpha and beta here, these constants, it just means that this cubic cur curve, or rather the cubic polynomial here, has three distinct roots. 
Now, the important features of this cubic curve is that it has an abelian group structure. Let's suppose we denote it by this direct sum symbol here. And as such, it also has a zero. Now, to get this group structure, we saw that this was actually isomorphic to the two torus by using Weierstrass p functions. And what does that Weierstrass p function do? That Weierstrass p function had poles at zero, which means it sends the zero to the point at infinity on this curve. So the zero on this cubic curve C is at infinity. And something else that's rather interesting is you can work out what the invariant differential is. And it's just dx on y. Since y squared equals this cubic term here, that's just dx on the square root of this cubic here. So integrals of this invariant differential just give the elliptic integrals that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. And now we can apply exactly the same argument as we did over here to get a similar addition law. It states that if you pick two points on the curve and you integrate from the zero, which is in this case infinity, up to those points, so infinity to x1, y1, this invariant differential, plus the integral from infinity to x2, y2 of this differential, that's exactly the same as the integral from infinity to the new point that you get by adding these two points together in the group law of this cubic curve. And in fact, there's a formula for what this sum is, although I won't write it here. And that gives you a very explicit relationship between three definite integrals of this differential here. And this is a wonderful formula in the theory of complex analysis called the addition law. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.